And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so uh, Dr. Magda Santana uh, is a junior researcher interested in translational research in the ataxia field. She earned her doctoral degree in pharmacology and pharmacotherapy from the University of Coimbra, Portugal. Uh, she currently focuses on the development of biomarkers, preclinical models such as iPSCs and rodent models, and drug and gene therapies for SCA3, also known as Machado Joseph's disease. Dr. Santana is a key contributor to the ESME project and a member of the SCA Global Young Investigators, as well as the Portuguese Association for Hereditary Ataxia Initiatives. And with that, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Santana. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you for this very nice introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the project that I was bordered in 2019, already a few years ago. So this was uh, basically a project that uh, came up uh, due to my work that I was developing uh, at that time. So I will start for from the first beginning. So more uh, a little bit of the introduction for the disease, uh, which I know it's well known for this audience. So, but as you know. Uh, spinal cellular ataxia type 3 is also called Machado Joseph disease, uh, and uh, it is the most common dominantly in it, uh, spinal cellular ataxia. Uh, and if you can look and have a look to this map, you can see that he of this disease, and particularly uh, in the Azores Island, that or located in here in the globe, uh, you will find the highest prevalence uh, worldwide. So this disease is particularly uh, important in our uh, country. And we have a huge research group and many others focused uh, in study, understanding and find therapies for Joseph disease or scatry. Just to remind the, about the cause of the disease, so this is a genetic disorder that is caused by a mutation in the ataxin 3 gene. Uh, this mutation basically consists of a repetition of the trinucleotide CAG, uh, which then translates into uh, the glutamine amino acid. So in a normal condition, you have between 10 and 51, depending on the publication, uh, CAG repetitions, and you have a good uh, and normal ataxin 3 protein uh, that has uh, the normal function and works um, as a ubiquitinization enzyme. Uh, when you have over uh, 65, 60 CAG repetitions within the ataxin gene, uh, this leads to the formation of a mutated protein that unfortunately uh, tends to aggregate and accumulate within the brain. So one hallmark of this disease is the presence of this protein uh, aggregation within the, the brain of the, the patients, within the cells, and this protein mainly accumulates in the nucleus of the cell, as you can see here in this picture. So uh, this uh, mutation uh, somehow leads to the disturbance of the cell, cellular dysfunction that ultimately causes in cell death uh, within the brain. For this disease, uh, we know there are some important uh, pathways affected, uh, particularly the, um, the cerebellum, brain stem, uh, basal ganglion, spinal cord. So uh, basically, you can see here that these are uh, some described uh, zones uh, within the brain that are affected. Uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, the patients have some clinical manifestations, and as you know, uh, the most uh, 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 clinical manifestation patients are progressive ataxia, but they also have other uh, symptoms like dystonia, dysphagia, uh, also uh, eye problems, vision problems, muscle atrophy, and uh, uh, sleep disturbance, among others. So. Uh, basically, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a disease that is uh, causes a, a suffering for the patient, 
And uh, because of this and for some therapies for this disease, many research groups have been focused on understanding the mechanisms of the uh, SCAT3 and also other uh, uh, similar uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And uh, a great job has been done in the in the over the last years, and we already know there are some mechanisms and some pathways affected. And they all start with the uh, mutation in the gene, as I told you, and with the formation of the protein, toxic fragments of these proteins and uh, uh, disaggregates um, and these uh, toxic fragments somehow uh, make some dysfunction uh, in the many uh, molecular and pathways that we can find within the cell. Uh, that we already know that are dysregulated. Some examples are the autophagy pathway, the calcium signaling, mitochondrial function, uh, transcriptional uh, regulation. So we uh, nowadays know that these mechanisms uh, are highly um, affected in this disease. And uh, due to these discoveries, um, many uh, therapeutic uh, approach and uh, uh, therapeutic agents have been developed targeting these uh, pathways. And here you can find some examples. We know that there have been um, some gene silencing therapies developed. We have uh, uh, some preclinical studies uh, done by our group, but other collaborators have been working a lot in silencing the gene to alleviate or treat um, SCAT3. Uh, but many other uh, strategies that can be uh, found uh, and that was uh, that were explored uh, in uh, preclinical models uh, uh, that nowadays they are close to reach a clinical trial stage, and this is very important because this um, this has become a, a work that has been done uh, during a lot of time, and we have patients that uh, uh, have expectations to have. Uh, a therapy that will, will come very soon. And uh, for that, and to be successful in this clinical trials, we all know that biomarkers are very important and they are needed for monitoring the disease progression and the response to therapy. So when we, uh, when we think about biomarkers, uh, uh, we know nowadays, and this is a very attractive field, that extracellular vesicles are uh, somehow very important and can be um, used as powerful bio uh, as pow powerful tools for biomarker research. So these extracellular vesicles are nanosized membrane surrounded structures that are basically uh, released by all uh, type of cells, and we can find uh, the the main or the most abundant subtypes subtypes. They are exosomes microvesicles and apoptotic bodies. Uh, and they basically uh, differ from each other uh, regarding the, how they uh, develop or their biogenesis. Uh, and you can see that exosomes, they are formed through the endosomal pathway and they can release uh, by the cells. Uh, the microvesicles, they just form by burning this, the, at the cell surface. And you can find the apoptotic bodies that they basically uh, are formed um, due to cell fragmentation. And they, these uh, uh, different subtypes of vesicles, they have different uh, size and they, they also um, can vary in the, their contents. But basically, they are very important uh, to mediate cell-to-cell -cell communication, and all of them, they, um, contain, they contain inside a variable cargo of uh, molecules such as DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, that basically reflect the biomolecular composition of the tissues uh, or cells of uh, where they derive from. So basically, uh, this uh, can provide uh, somehow a signature of the molecular state of the cell, uh, and they can, uh, and this is very important for neurodegenerative disease, they can um, cross the blood-brain barrier, and we can uh, isolate these uh, extracellular vesicles from uh, biological foods 
such as uh, the blood and the blood derived um, uh, constituent like serum or plasma. So uh, these as uh, these extracellular vesicles are therefore very attractive uh, for biomarker research. And having this in mind, uh, in 2019, uh, uh, I proposed a project uh, uh, that uh, uh, major aim was to identify or develop a blood-based biomarker for SCA3 uh, by performing the analysis of extracellular vesicles uh, from plasma uh, that we uh, could obtain from patients and controls, and also from um, cellular models, the relevant cellular models that were uh, neuronal countries from iPS cells. So the idea was available from the ESME initiative, and afterwards, since we have the opportunity to 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 have the access of the the biosamples from the ESME cohort to validate these biomarkers uh, using these uh, samples. So, to start and initiate this project, the first question that uh, uh, we uh, need to answer was which method should we use to uh, isolate these extracellular vesicles? And at that time, uh, when you look at the literature, the most conventional method we use uh, was ultra centrifugation, and is still a uh, 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 method for uh, every isolation that is widely used worldwide. But uh, this method required uh, a large time consuming, um, and it was hard working to to isolate the the every uh, through this method, and it requires a large of volumes, which was not what we have when we think about uh, uh, human samples, we would need a specific equipment that was not accessible for all uh, research centers if we could think about implementing this in a clinical setting. So uh, this method would be the best approach. And sometimes we could have low purity of the extracellular vesicles that aggregate together with the other uh, contaminants, particularly if uh, So having this in mind, we have a look for other uh, methods that could be uh, easily applied and implemented in the clinics. And we uh, basically, oops. Sorry, we basically end up with a um, size exclusion chromophy that looks like uh, a method that, that was uh, very simple and fast. And as the adventure that could use a very uh, low input volumes, and uh, there was no need to have a special equipment. So this uh, was a method that could be easily implemented in a, a clinical setting and all around the world uh, for biomarker research. And we could uh, obtain extracellular vesicles with medium purity in a relatively easy uh, manner. So having this in mind, uh, we uh, basically established a protocol. We need a protocol that was quite simple and was based on commercially available um, columns. Uh, so we basically collect the, the, the plasma from um, the patients and the controls. And this, this plasma was filtered, uh, and then uh, by using only 900 microliters of plasma, collect, uh, collect many fractions uh, where we expected to have uh, the extracellular vesicles uh, in some of these fractions. So the, basically, the size exclusion chromophy uh, method allows the separation of the extracellular vesicles due to uh, a difference in the size uh, of the the particles. So when we run the plasma in, into the column, there was a resin inside with some uh, particles inside, and the big um, molecules do not penetrate, and they are the first to be eluted, as you can see here. And the other ones take more time uh, to be eluted as they they go into the pores of the the resin that is inside the column. So according to uh, 
the information that we obtained from the columns, we knew that the, the extracellular vesicles would uh, elute in the uh, fractions between 6, 7 to 10, and the other proteins, the contaminants of the plasma, would elute afterwards. So to validate this method, we initiate uh, our investigation. Let's see. And here you can find uh, one of our first experiments was to, to identify the fraction where the extracellular vesicles, uh, in fact, uh, eluted. And you can see here that this fraction 11 to fraction 29, almost, you have the most of the plasma proteins um, that act as contaminants. You can clearly see here, this is albumin, uh, that is the most uh, abundant protein in plasma. And we know that the um, uh, extracellular vesicles would uh, be uh, and would be looted here in these fractions. Uh, so having this in mind, uh, we perform a characterization of these uh, fractions. And first of all, we try to look uh, by using transmission electron microscopy uh, to um, these fractions and clearly found uh, the presence of these extracellular vesicles that they are very small and they have this round cup uh, shaped morphology resembling the red blood cells due to the fixation step and the hydration. And we, can, we could uh, determine the size of these samples, uh, the, these vesicles and realize that uh, ma the majority of the vesicles have a size below 150 uh, nanometers. We also observed that there was an increase in the number of particles seven to fraction 10. So with this information, we decided to analyze by Western blot different combinations of these fractions that pull together to see where uh, we could obtain the most pure fraction uh, with less contaminants. So, here you can see uh, this analysis. We, we uh, looked for different extracellular vesicle markers and also cellular mar markers uh, such as calnexin to make sure that uh, there was no cellular contaminants in our samples. And when you look here for uh, these experiments, uh, when you looked for uh, the fraction 8 to 10 together, when they were pulled, you can see a good uh, expression of this CD81 marker and, and all fairly detected uh, the cellular marker calnexin, which was not what we observed in the other fractions because we could find some con contamination here that we thought that could be from fraction 7 uh, that could carry some uh, cellular debris um, and would uh, appear here as uh, this with this cellular marker. So basically, we decide to move on to the analysis of the RNA that we could obtain from these extracellular vesicles. And here we could also confirm that the fraction uh, 8 to 10 uh, was uh, very clean and contained. You can see here. Uh, was enriched in small RNAs. This is the leather, uh, and this is an automated electrophoresis where you can see the RNA. And basically, this fraction was particularly enriched in a small RNAs. And if you could compare to the old blood uh, obtained from prax gene tubes here, it's totally different what's uh, inside. So if you could compare here with cell, and uh, you can see that what we have is, is a totally different uh, a content from the other uh, fractions. Uh, so afterwards, we uh, performed to, uh, and tried to do a small RNA sequencing, and we confirmed that the majority of the RNAs contained uh, in these cellular vesicles were microRNAs. This was kind of described in the literature. And uh, according to our experiments, we are able to establish this protocol and publish this um, as a simple method uh, and with a pipeline where you could uh, easily isolate uh, extracellular vesicles from blood uh, by using these columns uh, and these fractions. And we could collect uh, material to do uh, a, a full characterization of these vesicles. 
vesicles, namely the, the size and the concentrations, the total protein quantification, and even the contaminants of the samples. Uh, and the other remaining volume could be used for um, transcriptional research or proteomic analysis. So we could be able to um, establish this protocol uh, from human plasma. So to move on with our project, the next question was, could we use this protocol and the same approach to isolate uh, uh, the extracellular vesicles from uh, IPS-derived uh, neuronal cultures? And this was the second part uh, uh, of the work, try to accomplish of the problem. Uh, and uh, I have to mention here uh, that for that we use the IPS cell lines that we have uh, in our lab. Uh, and I have to mention that uh, these IPS cell lines were also established uh, in the group um, by me. Uh, during my postdoc fellowship that I was also awarded by uh, National Ataxia from 2016. So uh, at that time, I established uh, these IPS cell lines uh, culture under feeder-free conditions in the lab. These cell lines are nowadays used uh, by many uh, of uh, our um, members of the group for many different projects. And at this and we are able to improve the methods that we proposed and that we uh, established at that time. And nowadays we have these very nice neuronal cultures uh, that uh, are derived from patient, patient cells. Uh, we are able uh, to uh, kind of have a, a reproducible protocol uh, that leads us to obtain these uh, cultures characterized by the, the presence of uh, astrocytic uh, markers such as GFAP, but also neuronal markers, the major neuronal mar marker MAP2 and also the early neuronal marker uh, TUSH1. So we have uh, done the characterization of these cells. I'm not going to show the data today, but we thought that we could try to use the um, condition and median of this culture to isolate the extracellular vesicles uh, and try to do it using the same uh, protocol or a very similar. So we started from this condition of medium around uh, 5 uh, ml to 10 ml of the medium. And we, uh, since we have these columns and uh, at that time, this is important to, to say, uh, these columns uh, were only available to run volumes about 2 ml. So we have to concentrate the samples uh, to uh, 2 ml volume. Uh, try to uh, fix the volume that could be um, uh, loaded into the column. And nowadays there are many, many different columns that uh, can uh, be run with different volumes and, and this um, could not be necessary. So unfortunately, uh, these were not good news at the time. Uh, uh, we could not uh, uh, isolate the extracellular vesicles Using this method, we we probably say um, we thought that this could be due to the manipulation that we have to perform before to concentrate the medium, uh, and as you can see here, we could not observe any of the markers in the function that we uh, wanted to have the extracellular vesicles. This is the extracellular vesicle marker, so we were not successful in implementing the same methods for, for the isolation of the, the extracellular vesicles from the culture, um, the neuronal cultures. So nevertheless, and since the project was only for one year, we have to move on. Uh, and we decided to move with the samples from uh, patients, the, the plasma from patients. And we designed this uh, study where we initiated from a small uh, discovery cohort. Uh, we use the sample from 12 controls, 10 pre-ataxic subjects, and 10 ataxic patients. We collect the plasma, we isolate the, the extracellular vesicles with the method that we established, and we first did the characterization of the extracellular vesicles regarding the size, the number, and the RNA content. Afterwards, we performed a smaller RNA sequencing analysis. Um, 
and uh, we were mainly focused on the analysis of microRNAs as we uh, could uh, have the information from previous experiment that was the the RNA um, that was present in the most abo um, more abundant in the extracellular vesicle. So. After this, uh, we select a set of microRNAs for validation in a larger cohort and uh, qPCR uh, and afterwards correlation with the clinical data available for, from um, the, the visit when we collect the sample. So here I can show that when we analyze the, the extracellular vesicles by nanoparticle tracking analysis, there was no difference in the size of the samples of the extracellular vesicles between the groups. Uh, and we could all, uh, not also see a difference in, uh, in the number and the concentration of these um, extracellular vesicles uh, in um, ataxic, pre-ataxic, um, patients compared to controls. So there was no difference between the groups regarding the size and particle number. Uh, when we looked for the RNA uh, content and concentration, we could observe a tendency to have a lower RNA content in um, pre-ataxic and ataxic um, uh, patients compared to controls. So these were the first findings that we could observe uh, a tendency to have uh, lower RNA levels in the vesicles. We move on uh, through the RNA sequencing, particularly the small RNA sequencing analysis of these samples. And uh, we can see here, uh, let me see, that we could find 1,006 microRNAs uh, detected in extracellular vesicles. So from these 1,006 microRNAs, only 262 microRNAs show to have a cumulative read count over uh, 1,000 reads. So the other ones were detected in a very, very low amount. So we decided to move on with the analysis of these uh, microRNAs. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, when we perform a differential expression analysis, uh, we could observe that there was 53 uh, differentially expression microRNAs uh, when we compared the control to the toxic group. Uh, but uh, we could only find six differentially expressed microRNAs when we compared the controls with the pre -ataxic. So it looked like the pre uh, group was very similar to the control group. Uh, and in the between, we could find that there was a difference in 38 microRNAs that were differentially expressed between the pre ataxic uh, and the taxic group. So, having this in mind, uh, we could identify uh, 60, uh, uh, six microRNAs that were unique in these um, three groups, and we perform a PCR. Uh, analysis, the principal component analysis, to to see if there we could uh, segregate these um, these samples according to the RNA content or the microRNA content. And, and as you can see here, it was a surprise because we could clearly distinguish the ataxic patients from uh, the controls and from the pre-ataxic when we uh, perform this uh, principal component component analysis taking into account these 66 microRNAs that were differentially expressed between the groups. Uh, we have one exception here uh, regarding one pre-ataxic patient that was located uh, in the ataxic group. Uh, and most interesting, we could find that there was some kind of four uh, um, pre-ataxic uh, uh, patients that uh, somehow were not so close to the control group and was uh, were, were situated between the control and the toxic uh, group. And this was a very interesting result. And we also tried to understand, uh, taking into account which pathways could be affected uh, and which could be identified uh, that could be related to the disease and could be regulated. For that, we try to identify the targets 
of these uh, microRNAs that were dysregulated in the between the groups, and we could uh, identify according to the targets of these microRNAs that uh, that proteins that were targeted by these microRNAs were particularly um, related to stress uh, response, namely to oxidative stress uh, and chemical stress. So this was uh, particularly interesting uh, because uh, we knew that these pathways were um, altered in the disease. And also we can find here some pathways related to the metabol metabolic process. And you'll see afterwards what this our hypothesis regarding the these um, microRNAs and these pathways that are altered. So basically, uh, after these experiments, we uh, decide to move on and try to identify a few set of microRNAs, a few microRNAs that could be used as a biomarker for the disease. And I'm, I'm not going uh, into detail, but we use for this selection the Um, uh, data that we have unpublished regarding the microRNA expression uh, in the scattery mice model that we have uh, a collaboration in our group uh, um, that uh, was that uh, was studying the microRNAs in uh, transgenic mice, and also we have published and we have identified previous studies with some. Um, deregulated microRNAs in uh, patients' neuronal cultures and also in uh, patient brain. So we take uh, this information into account and also other studies in the literature to identify a set of biomarkers of microRNAs to validate by qPCR. So this was a little bit disappointed. Uh, so when we analyzed these, these microRNAs by qPCR, we unfortunately could not observe uh, any significant difference between the groups, uh, despite this um, tendency for uh, an increase in this LED7 microRNA compared to controls um, here. So nevertheless, we decided to correlate uh, this data with uh, some clinical uh, and demographical data. And we realized that there was one microRNA that uh, correlated with the SARS score. So this was the main finding of this analysis. And as you can see here, uh, the correlation that we obtained, the samples were not very high. Uh, but uh, it's not very, very significant. And uh, uh, I have to, to confess that we have a huge um, difficulty in uh, quantifying these microRNAs because for most of the microRNAs that we try to optimize the quantification by qPCR, they were barely detected and they were close to the, the limit of detection. It was hard to detect the, these microRNAs. We assume that since they are from the brain, probably the amount of RNAs that are detected in the vesicles uh, could be diluted with other uh, microRNAs. And this was uh, one of the limitations of the study. Nevertheless, uh, we could uh, uh, basically uh, point out these uh, microRNAs as potential candidates as biomarkers. But uh, more than this, what I realized in my hypothesis is that probably is not one microRNA, uh, but uh, it should be the whole content of RNAs that could be uh, the biomarker for the disease. So the idea is that probably uh, to focus only on one or two or few biomarkers would not be enough to capture the whole uh, mechanisms and the whole um, the all uh, alterations that are uh, that are implicated in this in the disease, and then could track uh, the progression from a pre-ataxic to an ataxic uh, stage. Uh, so, having this in mind, uh, and to to finish our uh, last experiments and our la uh, last analysis, uh, we uh, decide to have a look 
not only for microRNAs, but for the whole uh, content uh, uh, of RNAs that we could detect uh, in uh, the RNA sequencing. And we could find uh, this idea was not in, um, new because we knew from the literature that there were new biomarkers, new potential RNAs, uh, non-coding RNAs that could be used as biomarkers and as a, a potential therapeutic targets for neurogenerative disease. And of course, that we knew that the microRNA content was the, the most abundant in the extracellular vesicles, but there were other RNAs such as small nuclear RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, PWRNAs, and also tRNAs fragments that uh, have been shown to be relevant and have an importance in, uh, in pathological man mechanism in many diseases and uh, recently very uh, new um, uh, publications that there can all be important in neurogenerative diseases. Uh, so having this in mind, we have a look on the RNA biotypes abundancy uh, that, uh, that we, we could extract from the RNA sequencing data. And we can clearly see an interesting uh, difference in the ataxic uh, samples, the samples derived from ataxic patients. Uh, if, we, if you can see here, uh, and we did the statistical analysis uh, for this, we could observe an increase in the mitochondrial tRNA also uh, in mitochondrial RNA, you can see here in orange, uh, and also in small nuclear RNAs and small nuclear RNAs. These were the RNAs that were a statistically significant um, uh, difference between uh, the controls and pre attacks and the ataxic group. So according to this data, we could clearly observe that every uh, from ataxic patients were enriched in mitochondrial, nuclear, and nuclear, nuclear RNA compared to pre ataxic and control subjects. And this was one of our major findings, particularly re relevant because uh, nowadays some studies have been shown that uh, if you think about the mitochondria, uh, we know uh, and there are some studies that the mitochondria can be incorporated in extracellular vesicles uh, when uh, some pathways such as the lysosomal pathway are distur disturbed. So these are very um, interesting uh, results. So to summarize what we could obtain uh, in this uh, project, uh, you can see that we could clearly distinguish the, the ataxic patients from pre-ataxic end controls, taking into account the microRNA content of these plasma-derived extracellular vesicles. We pointed out uh, uh, a microRNA that could uh, be a promising uh, candidate uh, for biomarker, but most important that, than this, we re realized that probably uh, there is uh, no one, no specific uh, microRNA that could be sufficient to track the disease uh, progression for this, this disease and other uh, diseases. Um, and finally, we could observe that the toxic patients um, have extracellular uh, vesicles enriched in mitochondrial RNAs, small nuclear, nuclear RNAs, and nuclear RNAs. And of course, that we have many questions uh, from now on, uh, particularly what is the importance and the role of these RNAs uh, in the disease. And are they potential therapeutic targets? Uh, so these are questions that uh, need to be solved. But we could uh, uh, show with this uh, project that extracellular vesicles, they are good uh, promising uh, biomarker candidates for uh, SCA3 and probably for uh, other diseases and other uh, SCAs. Uh, so uh, based Basically, I would like to highlight, and this is important because uh, National Ataxia Foundation uh, is supporting me through uh, my career. So I would like to point out what I, has, I achieved with this project. Uh, and basically, one was the publication regarding the protocol um, uh, for isolation of extracellular vesicles from plasma. 
but we also uh, submitted a, a provisional patent application for this small uh, non-coding RNAs in extracellular ventricles as biomarkers for uh, these and other disorders. And we also submitted a manuscript uh, recently with this uh, uh, information regarding the small RNAs in extracellular vesicles. So additional, uh, and uh, due to this important contribution for my career, uh, National Ataxia Foundation um, uh, funding was extremely important for me uh, to obtain uh, further projects uh, that were funded by national uh, agencies. Uh, and also I was able to recruit some students to work uh, in a taxi field, and this was uh, very important. So just to finish, I would like to thank all the research group and particularly some, some, some colleagues that were involved in the work. And I cannot forget uh, Professor Luis Pereira de Almeida, which has been my mentor through all this process. And uh, without him, it would be impossible to, to move forward uh, with my research. Uh, so it's, I would like to acknowledge him. Of course, uh, I cannot forget the ESMI partners. This has been a very, very amazing and, and interesting collaboration. Uh, I am proud to be part of this uh, group and to be work with them uh, for such a long time. They're, they have been incredible uh, for for my progression and for my my to give me the knowledge in this field. Also, the clinicians that we have at the at the hospital. And uh, uh, finally, Margarida Gama Carvalho and Tanya Reed of the um, small RNA sequencing data, and, and of course, the National Ataxia Foundation. So I think that's it. I'm open to questions. Thank you for a fantastic talk, Dr. Santana. And just a reminder for folks on the call, there's two ways that you can ask questions. Uh, you can either put them in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. I already see we have one question that's been submitted. Uh, or you can use the raise hand feature and we can call on you to ask your question live. Uh, so please feel free to submit your questions through those two methods. And let's ask uh, the first question here. Uh, so one attendee asked, is it possible to isolate uh, extracellular vesicles derived from brain in plasma or directly in CSF? Has this been tried before? Yes, that's a very interesting question. It is, and it, it is. And uh, uh, so when we initiated uh, this project, there were not uh, too many uh, protocols developed for that. Uh, uh, but nowadays, we can see in the literature some uh, research group that uh, isolated uh, um, extracellular vesicles from the brain by uh, some methods that uh, basically capture uh, some proteins uh, in the membrane of the extracellular vesicles that are known to be uh, present in the brain and they are related to the brain. So be captured and the, these extracellular vesicles could be isolated from uh, the brain. Uh, so this is, was a way to go afterwards, but <laughs> at that time this was this was really the the, the initial uh, study. Of course. And then our next question is from another attendee who says, "A uh, hi, great talk." How difficult is it to extend analysis to longer RNA subtypes, uh, including mRNA? Sorry? Oh, oh, no worries. I think my uh, internet dropped. Uh, the next question yeah. is from an attendee who says, hi, great talk. How difficult is it to extend analysis to longer RNA subtypes, uh, including uh, even mRNA? Yeah, uh, thank you. That is a very nice uh, question. It's not difficult. So uh, uh, it's, it really depends on the type of RNAs that we have in the vesicles. So we know that the most abundant RNAs, they are small, but uh, we know that there are fragments from other uh, longer RNAs. And of course, I can say that we afterwards did that analysis. We, we looked for the protein coding RNAs that we have within the vesicles. And we, we do have very interesting results because most 
of the messenger RNA that that um, codifies proteins. So probably they are not full messenger RNAs, but the ones that we could identify, they basically are related to mitochondria uh, pathways. And it was very interesting because this corroborates the finding that we have regarding the metabolic changes of the pathways regarding to the microRNA and also uh, um, correlate with this information that we have about the mitochondrial RNA present uh, in these ataxic patients. So, uh, and this is very interesting because nowadays we know from the literature that mitochondria can be in, uh, incorporated in extracellular vesicles. It's very important to look for all these other RNAs uh, in these vesicles. Fantastic. And then I have a question. Uh, when you were showing the data correlating how uh, different mRNAs can either predict in the discovery cohort with either uh, pre-ataxic patients, controls, or ataxic patients, you mentioned how it was interesting how these mRNAs had functions in oxidative stress response. Could you elaborate on why this is interesting to the field as a whole? Yeah, yeah, that's, that, for me, uh, and for my idea, uh, it's, it's basically related to this. We know from the literature, it's well described that there are uh, alterations in mitochondrial function, and also uh, there, are, there are many difficulties uh, in uh, uh, deal with the uh, oxidative stress, and we know that this is a fact altered in the these and also the past. And when we found that the uh, these pathways and these microRNAs were implicated in these pathways with, of course, our idea is that since the cells are under stress, uh, they start to communicate to other uh, cells and they release these extracellular vesicles, basically saying that we are under stress and we have this content and by this they communicate. And we can clearly identify the, the, the stressful st the state that this cell uh, has uh, before even they die. So this could be uh, an early, um, early biomarker for these uh, alterations. That's absolutely fascinating. And then we have another uh, question from an attendee. Uh, great talk, Magna. Have you analyzed the protein content in those extracellular vesicles? No, we, we haven't analyzed the protein. It's something that we would like to do, but we we need to have funding for this analysis and and uh, uh, it's something that, of course, it would be very interesting to, to do and move forward. And also one thing that was critical was that uh, we realized that could not be um, enough to analyze single RNAs and it would be really necessary to go through uh, RNA sequencing for mm -hmm. all the the, the the samples which limits the analysis because you know the the expenses the expenses for yeah. doing a RNA it would increase the cost but it's really the way to go in my opinion of course well building off of that in terms of next steps where do you see this research going now that you have these findings how is it going to progress in the future what are the next things you're looking into yeah, you know, I, I would really be uh, happy if I could uh, go further uh, and try to help uh, the small RNAs, in particular these small nuclear RNAs and, and mitochondrial RNAs that are in the vesicles. This was very clear that we almost uh, have no uh, content of these RNAs in the control. It's very uh, relevant and we, despite they are very small amounts, they really increase in the patients. And this, this needs to, to be something here. And there's very, very few data in the literature regarding the functions of these RNAs and the role in the, the disease. So uh, we could have some new, new potential uh, therapeutic targets here. We need to, to look for this new, um, species that um, particularly seems to be important in the disease. So this was the first evidence, any alteration in this uh, type of RNA for scattering, of course. 
So what I'm hearing is that you've discovered quite a bit, but these discoveries have only led to more questions and more things to potentially discover. And that's good. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how yeah. research works. Um, and then just looking at the question panel, I'll uh, guess one final question from me. Uh, the focus of this talk has largely been uh, Machado Joseph disease and SCA3. Is there anything known about extracellular vesicles in other forms of ataxia? Uh, I think there are some studies, even there is uh, some studies in the, um, also in um, SCA3, mm -hmm. uh, and this, this was one of the study that we looked for when we uh, performed this study. Uh, and the most critical thing, and now there is more, um, uh, there are more studies and uh, the methods have improved, but one limitation that there, there is still in the field is uh, the difference in the isolation methods. Uh, and this uh, uh, leads to uh, differences in the content of the vesicles because as I explained, the vesicles, uh, there are many different types of the vesicles. And if you have uh, uh, different types of the vesicles in the population, you can find different things. So I know that there are some studies, including for uh, uh, SCA3, uh, but it's, it's difficult to reproduce the data, and that's mm -hmm. particular studies, we, we use them to select the common uh, microRNA that we could found uh, in those studies that could be um, used to get uh, try to identify which microRNAs could be relevant for the disease. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, uh, it's always... Uh, uh, room for improvements, particularly in the isolation methods. But nowadays, they are quite better than a few years ago. Well, thank you so much uh, for clarifying that. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, speaking with us today and giving your time and expertise. I don't see any other questions uh, in the Q&A window. So if everyone can join me at our individual Zoom screens, uh, thanking Dr. Santana again for joining us today. Uh, and then for everyone who's on the call, I hope you learned something. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a good weekend ahead. Take care, folks. Thank you.